Hallo und herzlich willkommen zum Talk mit Val McDermott im Rahmen der Leipziger Buchmesse und der British Book Days, einer Veranstaltungsreihe von Drömer Knauer. Ich freue mich schon auf das Gespräch mit Val McDermott. Mein Name ist Günther Keil. Kurz noch eine Information vorab. Ein Bild der Niedertracht heißt der neue, der 35. Roman von Val McDermott. Und das ist der sechste Fall für Karen Peary in ihrer erfolgreichen Cold Case Krimi-Reihe. Genug der Vorsprache. Jetzt bin ich wirklich ähm, gespannt und ich freue mich sehr. I'm really pleased and delighted to welcome Val McDermott. Hello. Hello, thank you. I wish I was in Leipzig in person. I've really missed coming to Germany this last year. How have you been over this um, pandemic year? Well, I've been pretty well, really. Uh, I'm lucky enough to, to live in, in Edinburgh most of the time, uh, and that's where I've been locked down. And Edinburgh is not a bad city to be locked down in. There's lots of parks and lots of green areas. We live close to the river. Uh, and everyone was so intent on going to the park that the city was empty. So we could explore the city without the constant uh, battle to get past the tourists and the, the acts at the Edinburgh Festival trying to give us their flyers and, and tell us what great time we were going to have at their show. So it was, uh, it was like discovering the city all over again. Uh, and, uh, you know, thankfully, uh, I, I, had, I had COVID very mildly at the start of the pandemic, but we recovered from that and uh, been healthy ever since, really. So it's been not too bad. So we're going to talk about your new novel, surely, but I'd like to start with porridge and the recipe of porridge. <laughs> <laughs> well, because of the, the issues of, of um, the pandemic, of course, we couldn't do live book events. Uh, so I was doing events just on Zoom like this. And I became quite conscious quite quickly that I was beginning to be boring to myself, never mind to the, the, the listeners and viewers, because for writers, we only have one story. You know, it's not like stand-up comedians who can write a whole new shtick. If you're a writer, you've only got one story about how you became a writer, one story about why you chose to write crime fiction. So I got fed up of saying the same things again and again and again, but I still wanted to be able to engage with my readers. And so uh, one of the things I get a lot of questions about over the years is the, the things that people eat in the books, the, what, the meals they eat. And I do have people sit down and, and, and eat quite a lot in, in the books because that's how we live our lives. With, we, we're working with someone, we'll sit and have something to eat with them or we're, we're on the road with someone, we'll go and have something to eat. These are, these are facts of life. Is, and so... Uh, there were quite a few, I suppose, occasions when writers, readers had written to me and said, what's the recipe for this particular dish? I can't find it anywhere. So we thought it would be fun uh, maybe to, to do some online recipes. And so we started making videos, uh, cooking the books, recipes from the fiction kitchen. And we started with Hamish's hipster porridge. Was, uh, <laughs> Hamish uh, is, is a man who thinks that uh, oatmeal should be the mi minority ingredient in, in a bowl of porridge. So there's fruits and there's nuts and there's peanut butter and there's, there's all sorts in Hamish's porridge. And we, we started with that and, and people loved it. Thousands of people have now watched it on YouTube. And so we carried on uh, over several weeks and we've done a couple of specials since. Uh, it's just a bit of fun, really. So maybe this is a side effect, a very positive side effect of the pandemic. Um, you never know. <laughs> oh, so far, I don't think we've poisoned anyone. <laughs> Hopefully, yes. And I like the fact that now in your new novel, there is Hamish and there is um, Karen and Karen wondering about the way he does his porridge. <laughs> mm. Yeah, well, she's, she's concerned in a way about the, the, the nature of the relationship and, and the porridge becomes almost an emblem of her doubts about the relationship because they, ha they come from a very different background and Hamish comes from a, a, a prosperous middle-class background and Karen's background is, is very much a Scottish working class background and she thinks that they see the world differently and she's not sure if that's necessarily something that will make the relationship work or if it's going to be a, a, an insurmountable problem. So the conversation about the porridge comes about as a way of uh, discussing with her friend if the differences between them are, are, are too, too much. You know, she wanted to, to go for a weekend uh, on a croft in the Highlands to celebrate her birthday and he whisked her off to Venice for the weekend, which most people would normally think was, was definitely a better option. But she said, well, it wasn't what I asked for. So, you know, relationships are never simple, are they? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, you're right. 
Um, this situation, and especially the, the daily porridge situation, is very is lovely and funny. Um, but on the other hand, there's a lot of, um, yeah, there, there is the death of her former love of her life, of, of Phil. Um, and in a way, I guess she feels responsible to deal with this situation. How would you describe her condition in general? Uh, but I think she she's come to terms uh, a lot with with a lot of the, the immediate grief of Phil's death. But uh, the, the events at the beginning of, of this novel kind of bring it back into sharp focus for her and remind her of what she's lost. And, and, and you've got to feel a bit sorry for Hamish because it's, it's very difficult to compete with the dead. So, you know, he's, he's not exactly having an easy time of, of it uh, with these comparisons. He tries to do the best thing and doesn't always succeed in, in Karen's eyes. So yeah, that, in general, though, I think she's uh, getting stronger and she's in a better place than she was. And she's, I think, discovered her old relish for doing the job. She loves, she loves what she does and she's, she's got that passion back in, in, in full flow again. We talked about food now, and, and I was wondering, hmm, is it because um, Val likes lobster or no connection? <laughs> well, um, we, we have a, a, a cottage by the sea that we've not been to very much for this last year because of, of lockdown. But uh, the, it's, it's a fishing village, and it's still a working fishing village. And every day the boats go out and bring in lobster and crab principally. Uh, so that's something that uh, from my office here uh, in Fife, I can actually look out the window and see lobster boats. Uh, and, I, and I did, I thought that would be a good thing to, to good, good thing to use as a, a mechanism for starting the plot is the body that's uh, found in the, in the, the sea, just close to where I, I spend a lot of time. Uh, and yes, it is very convenient because as well as uh, having the, the lobster fishermen, we have the, the, the wholesale merchant who sells the lobsters. Uh, and we can go up to the top of the village and, and buy lobster very cheaply and throw it on the barbecue and have lobster for dinner at a price that doesn't feel luxurious. Yeah, great. Um, this dead body turns out to be or, or was a Paul Allard a man um, with a lot of secrets. When we read your new novel, we know, oh, that's it's not on the way and, and he's not the man that we think about. Um, what do you want to reveal about him and his life? Um, not very much, really. This is a novel I find it quite hard to talk about in, in any detail because uh, almost anything I say is a spoiler. Um, but uh, fairly quickly, the police realize that uh, this man who's been fished out of the sea is in fact uh, someone who was a, a, a suspect in a case 10 years before where a senior Scottish civil servant went missing and is believed to have been killed. And in fact, subsequently, the courts have declared him dead. And so that's how uh, a live case, if you like, becomes Karen Perry's responsibility, because Karen investigates only historic cases. But because the dead man was intimately connected with this previous case, it's passed on to her because she recently reviewed that. And so she begins to, to look into this and, and starts to uncover all sorts of unexpected uh, directions that weren't obvious 10 years before when the person in question went missing. And then there are traces leading to France, to Paris, and I like the fact that then there is a night train uh, drive by, uh, by Karen, obviously, and her colleague Daisy Mortimer. Do you have a connection to, to these night trains and the situation? Well, yeah, I, I love using the night train, the sleeper, the Caledonian sleeper, it's called, from, uh, from Euston to, uh, up to Edinburgh or indeed further on to Fife. The, the night trains go all the way up to the Highlands as well. Uh, and I, I always think it's, it, it saves me a day. If I've had to go to London for meetings and then I can, I can go to dinner in the evening and I can catch the train and I wake up and I'm home again. It's morning and I can start the day and I've not wasted the day travelling sitting in a train or hanging around an airport. I've just made it home. Uh, and uh, it, there's always seems to me to be something romantic about the night train. It's, it's, a, it's a sense of adventure every time you, you get on the sleeper train. Uh, you, mm -hmm. There's a sense that anything can happen, but of course, in reality, nothing ever does. You know, I go off to my cabin, I have a, I have a glass of whiskey and I go to sleep. So, you know, the, the, the promise of romance, I suppose, the promise of adventure is always there, but it never quite happens. 
in the case of Karen and Daisy, there's surely more adventure than um, romance. Um, how, yes. you, <laughs> yeah. how would you describe the, um, them as a team? Are they good as a team? I think this is, this is a new professional relationship because, of course, uh, Karen's other uh, normal sidekick is, is Jason, uh, the, the, the mint, uh, as, as he's called because of his surname, Murray. Uh, and this time she's, uh, she's given a new colleague to work with on the, the, count, the, the case of the dead body in the, in the, for the fourth because that's a, as I say, it's a live case. It's also a historic case. So she's, Daisy has seconded to her from the, the murder squad, as it were. Uh, and she's young and uh, ambitious and bright and lively and pretty different from Karen. She's, she's also at the start of her career, she's a graduate trainee, she's got a lot to learn. She's come at the, 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 the police from a very different angle from Karen. And um, by and large, they get on pretty well, although Karen does have a deep and profound resentment of the fact that Daisy is one of these women who can eat her own body weight in cakes and biscuits and sandwiches and never put on any weight. I'm sure we all know people like that. You know, regrettably, I am not one of them. Uh, but uh, it, this is sort of, you know, Karen who, who sort of only has to look at a donut to see, to feel the pounds going on, uh, suddenly thinks this is, this is frustrating and it's not fair and starts getting quite, uh, um, you can't eat that in the car. I don't want crumbs in my car. <laughs> So it, it, I suppose it shows a, the, the human side of, of both of them. And I think, like all fiction, like all good fiction, uh, crime fiction relies on character. It's character that always drives the novel forward. It drives the reader forward. You read on because you care about the character. You want to know what happens to them. Uh, and it, it doesn't matter if you, you love them or, or if you hate them or if you just want them to end badly. Uh, you have to be engaged with the people in the book to, to carry on. And so I think for, for me, uh, developing a new professional relationship for Karen is, is another way of, of engaging the readers so that they feel that they're getting something, they're getting something fresh as well as the familiar things that they're used to. And does this in general mean that you plan your novels um, first by the, um, the characters and then by the plot? Um, it's, it's hard to sort of separate it out quite like that. For me, a book always starts with story. I have an idea, something interests me, I think, oh, that's interesting, or, oh, I didn't know that. Uh, and then I know whose book it is. Is it Tony Hill and Carol Jordan? Is it Carol Perry? Is it something completely different that I have to start from scratch? So um, once I know whose book it is, I then have to think about who are the other characters I need to make this story work? Mm -hmm. And then it almost becomes like a feedback system. You know, the plot feeds character, character feeds plot. As the, as the story develops, so the characters develop. And I have to figure out why a particular character behaves in the way that they do. Uh, and then I'm ready to write. There is a scene with Karen and Daisy. And um, I, I'll quote Daisy. She says, we are both not Hercule Poirot. And, and I had to laugh in this situation. Surely they are not a man, but um, you meant something different. Yeah, I meant that they're not just uh, sitting there uh, with letting their little grey cells do the work. They're actually out there um, investigating, interviewing, looking at, uh, the, looking at the details, the minutiae of the crime. Uh, it's not a case of, um, I suppose, it's not a traditional finding clues in the way that you would in an Agatha Christie or a Sherlock Holmes novel. It's a different kind of investigation and it's not one that's driven by one person's brilliant mind. It's a lot of it is about teamwork. A lot of it is about knowing where to look for what you need to find out. Talking about um, Poirot or you, you mentioned um, Maigret, um, do you think or, or we, should, um, we should claim that now is the century of the women investigators, isn't it? Um, in former days, uh, surely they all were men. Well, there was, um, although women were um, profoundly influential in the writing of the genre, you're right, they did tend to write male detectives. Um, and I think that revolution started in the 1980s with uh, writers coming in from America like uh, Sarah Paretsky and Sue Grafton reinventing, initially reinventing the private eye novel with female <laughs> characters. And that, I think, it's, it's, it's always the case with any kind of, of movement in, in literature that you need one person to push the door open a little bit 
uh, and the rest of us look on and go, why didn't I think of that? Uh, and so we now have you know, many women investigators. And of course, with the rise of the, the, detect uh, the domestic suspense novel, uh, many of those are driven by the, 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 a woman who's at the heart of the story. So yeah, I think it's, it's probably fair to say that uh, women are still writing a, a great big tranche of the best of crime fiction, but now we're putting women at the heart of our books as well. Not everyone in the book, but a lot of people do have nicknames. Um, please tell me more about the nickname of Karen. Some colleagues call her KP Nuts. Yeah. Um, KP Nuts. Uh, KP is a brand of uh, roasted peanuts in the UK. So, uh, of course, nuts means crazy. Uh, mm -hmm. So her, her initial is Karen Perry, KP. So she's got the nickname KP Nuts. Um, and... Uh, I think, I don't know if it's the same in Germany, but certainly in, in Scotland, uh, police officers all have nicknames for each other. Uh, mm -hmm. It happens in journalism as well. A lot of journalists have nicknames. Uh, uh, and so uh, I had to give Karen, it took me a little while to figure out a, a nickname for Karen. And then I thought, KP Nuts, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> and Jason is, Jason's, Jason's called The Mint because his name is Jason Murray. Mm -hmm. And we have, uh, we used to have a brand of mints in Scotland called Murray Mints. And the slogan was Murray Mints, Murray Mints, too good to hurry Mints. <laughs> and Jason is supposed to be a bit slow, you know, he's a bit slow on the uptake. So he becomes the mint because he's <laughs> Murray Mints. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the, um, and, and, you know, other senior officers also have, have nicknames. Uh, the, uh, one, Karen's former boss was called, was nicknamed the Macaroon. <laughs> again, because his, again, after a brand of confectionery, because a company called, his name was Simon Lees, and there's a brand of confectionery called Lees Macaroon Bars, which are very popular in Scotland. Uh, yeah. And so he was the macaroon. There is um, Marky, who is called Dog Biscuit. Yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's, that's another one. Um, we have a brand of, of dog treats. Uh, and so the, the dog biscuits are called Marky's. So Anne Marky is known as the Dog Biscuit. Um, with your novels, I like very much is that they are, they are not fun novels. Um, it's always a crime. It's a, an investigation. But I do have moments as a reader in which I have to laugh and there is a bit of irony. Um, is this something you, you plan intentionally or is it just happening during your writing process? I think it's a very Scottish thing. The Scots have a very black sense of humor. We, we, we always find humor in the darkness. Um, I suppose historically, um, life was often very difficult for many people living in Scotland. It was, uh, you know, sort of hard lives, uh, and uh, you have to laugh or else you just sit down and weep. And so traditionally, uh, we have this this gallows humour in Scotland. We we laugh in the in the, the darkest of places. I mean, some of the the funniest uh, public occasions I've been at have been funerals uh, where ministers have. have remembered the dead person in terms of, of you know, their life and, and told jokes about them and told funny stories from them. So, yeah, we do, we do like to, to laugh in the face of adversity, uh, which is probably just as well these days. Um, and uh, it is actually, I think, a, a common feature of Scottish crime fiction. Mm -hmm. It's often called, Scottish crime fiction is often called tartan noir. Yes. And I think there's a, there is, we are concerned with, with the darkness, the dark side of, of the human psyche. And uh, I, I, I often think it's, it's to do with the Reformation and, and uh, the, the sort of dark side of, of Scottish Protestantism. But the opposing force to sort of that dark Presbyterianism is, is the humour of, of, and, and the music and the dancing of the, the Gaelic side of our history. So uh, I think you've always got these two things pulling against each other. And that's often a feature of, of Scottish crime fiction is we have these, these dark obsessions with, with what goes on um, when when people's psychology goes twisted. But at the same time, we also find another kind of twist, which is the twist of humor. You are a very interested political person. Or is it something you, you think you have to put into on some um, pages? Uh, I think that all writers uh, incorporate their concerns in, in what they write in different ways. Uh, I never set out to write a, a book with a message. You know, I don't sit, sit down and think, oh, this is going to be my Brexit novel. 
But because my books are very much set in the here and now, and because I am, I, I am somebody who is, I suppose I'm still a bit of a news junkie. You know, I used to be a journalist and, and I'm still very interested in what goes on in the world around me. I'm very interested in politics. I'm very interested in the destiny of the country that I live in. Uh, so these things find their way into the books because they find their way into the lives of the people that I'm writing about. And to be honest, at the moment in Scotland, you can't not be involved in politics. It's the, it's the, it's the conversation that takes place all the time, everywhere. You know, you go to the pub with your friends and you talk about all sorts of things, but somewhere in the course of the evening, we'll end up talking about politics. It's, it is, it's an absolute concern at the moment, whichever side of the argument you are. Uh, so that is part of the landscape of my world, I suppose. Um, coming back to Karen, um, her personality evolves during your um, series and this with the sixth case. How would you describe her development? I suppose she's, she's grown older and she's grown wiser in many respects. She's had to fact deal with, with you know, complicated factors in her own life. Um, the, the death of someone that you love is a a very difficult thing to to move forward from and it does change you there's no doubt about that uh, i think she has become more confident of herself as a detective she's become more uh, aware i think of, of her, that she's that she really can do the job well and if anything she's become more determined to to give people answers about what's happened to their loved ones whose fate has never been adequately explained and that's really what what drives her uh, she's, I think she's, she's in a pretty good place just now. Uh, we'll have to see what the future brings. Because <laughs> I will be going back to her, definitely, no, no doubt about that. So despite all the other projects, there will be time for you to spend with Karen? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I've already got the idea for the next Karen Curry novel, so nothing to worry about there. And it's, Karen is currently being transferred to the small screen. Uh, we're presently filming The Distant Echo, which is mm -hmm. the first of the, the novels featuring her. Uh, and that's, as, as, as I say, is, is in production at the moment. Uh, just down the road from here, it's being filmed in St Andrews and just down the road from here in, in, in Fife. So that will be on British screens early next spring, I think. So I hope that you'll see that in Germany before too long also. Hopefully. Uh, you mentioned this first case. Is it true I read um, that um, the series developed um, by accident? Yeah, completely by accident. Um, uh, Karen plays a small but very significant role in The Distant Echo. Uh, and a couple of years after that, I had this idea for a cold case uh, also set in Fife. And because I'm fundamentally quite lazy, I thought, well, I've already got a cold case detective in Fife. I'll just, I'll just use her. Um, and so I, 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 I plucked Karen out of relative obscurity and, and, and wrote uh, A Darker Domain. And uh, it's often the way once you start working with a character again, you suddenly start to see all sorts of possibilities for them. And so, yes, yeah, she, she became someone who occupies a substantial part of my brain and my imagination. So, yeah, it, it wasn't intended. I, I didn't think, oh, I'll start another series because I've only got three of those. <laughs> Um, sadly, time is running um, off, but um, I'd like to talk about another um, talent of yours. And I realized during the research that you are also a great singer. Well, I don't know about great, but I do <laughs> sing, yes. Um, and it's been one of the great pleasures of the last few years to have been involved with uh, five other crime writers in, in a band we are called the Fun Loving Crime Writers. And we do cover versions of songs about murder and crime. Uh, and uh, we started off we started off as a bit of fun, really. Uh, the Edinburgh Book Festival had heard a couple of our guys uh, singing uh, impromptu in New Orleans and thought, oh, this should be a, they should make a band. And so we did our first performance at the Edinburgh Book Festival, I think, four years ago now. And we started doing uh, appearances at lots of book festivals. And then we were invited to go to Glastonbury, this huge oh. music festival. And, and, you know, rock stars galore and, and us. It's great fun. Um, we really, really missed not seeing each other, not singing together, not making music in lockdown. Um, but one of my, my band players, Doug Johnson, uh, is, is in Edinburgh. So we have got together a couple of times with his guitar and, and annoyed the neighbours by singing in the garden since we're not allowed to meet indoors. 
<laughs> we'd go out in the garden and sing, which I think was marginally better than the, the noises of people uh, taking the hedge trimmers and lawnmowers to, to the <laughs> garden. So I'm looking forward to, to see you on stage too, and, uh, and also not only with the readings, with your um, song, song colleagues and singing colleagues. And yeah, hopefully you'll be back with your books in Germany. And um, Belle, thank you very much for talking to us. It's been a great pleasure. It's been a great pleasure for me too. Thank you very much. And I hope everyone who's attending the book fair enjoys it enormously. Thank you very much. Bye bye.